So I'll present very briefly what our project has been and what we've been learning and share with you how we are, are marketing Maine. So I'll go over a little bit about who we are, the lessons learned from one of our first uh, research projects with you during this phase, which was a stock taking report of other economies that have successfully attracted investment in the product markets that you're interested in. And then lastly, share with you some of the materials and our approach to marketing Maine in, internationally and domestically. So by way of background, uh, the Interfor Group, we're a consulting firm in the forest industry space. We've been in business for about 40 years. Uh, our headquarters are in Helsinki, Finland. We have an office in Auckland, New Zealand, one in Melbourne, Australia, and I run the office in Washington, DC. We've engaged more than 500 clients over the past 40 years, and we have about 50 to 60 staff members in our offices around the world. We are a specialist consulting firm in the forest industry space. We do management consulting uh, for public and private clients. We do uh, quite a lot of work really focused on advancing environmentally and socially sustainable forestry and the bioeconomy. And so for that reason, it's been a real pleasure to work with Formain and their focus on the, the entire uh, ec ecosystem of industry, but also the, the resource and the forest resource and the sustainability in Maine. Uh, on this project, I'm joined by two other senior people from my team. Many of you have met Marcel or Yarno. Marcel is in our team in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, and he visited Maine several times in 2018 during that project. Uh, his specialty is the wood panel industry, and he's, uh, does a he has a background in technical feasibility studies, M&A, and advice to, uh, to large uh, panel and also pulp and paper manufacturers. Uh, we're also joined by Jarno Seppola on our team for this project. He's the head of uh, our office in Helsinki, and he has a long background in the forest bioeconomy uh, and particularly wood sourcing and wood supply in Europe. Our project has three phases. And the first, which began last year, was to assess and analyze Four Main's previous work, the incentives in competing regions, uh, site characteristics in Maine, and really where how is Maine positioned from the, the conclusion of our project in 2018 to the beginning of our new project in 2020. A lot had changed, and so we, we were getting up to speed on what was important to communicate externally. It was also during that phase that we did a stock taking report, and I'll share some of the results of that with you today, where we looked at economies that have been successful in attracting dissolving pulp manufacturing, you know, cellulose manufacturing, LVL, so, um, and then mass timber products like CLT, panel products like MDF, cellulosic sugars and pyrolysis oil. That report is available on the Formian website and um, it's composed of several case studies, which I'll explain to you. During the second phase of our project, it was a bit more heads down where we were preparing marketing materials and strategies. Uh, we also engaged with Sutherland Weston on that initiative to prepare some really attractive materials that we can share and Formian can share to highlight Maine. Uh, it's during that phase that we came to Maine in October. We had a brief respite of COVID and, and flew up and got to meet several communities and understand what their marketing efforts were like. Uh, so we visited Millinocket, East Millinocket, Lincoln, and Ashland. And then we're now in the third phase, which is to spread the word about Maine. So to identify in a syst systematic way companies that we think could be interested in Maine, leveraging into forest relationships in the uh, forest industry and communicate very proactively what's new in Maine and why Maine is an, an interesting location to invest in the future. So coming back to that lessons learned and the stock taking report, I'll share a few of the, the, uh, the lessons that we learned by looking at other economies around the world. Uh, the report, as I said, is available on the on the four main website, and you'll see in there that we identified several case studies around the world where they had successfully developed products or attracted investment in these emerging and also existing wood products that Maine is interested in. So 
In summary, we collected cases in the United States uh, from Oregon, Arkansas, Minnesota, North Carolina, California, and South Carolina. We also uh, looked north to Canada uh, and looked for CLT manufacturing cases, nanocellulose cases, and dissolving pulp. We also did a profile of how Quebec is marketing itself internationally. Then we uh, looked to Finland for cases in nanocellulose, dissolving pulp, pyrolysis oil, LVL, and put a lot of emphasis on how Finland had a whole of economy effort to transform its forest economy. Then uh, the last two cases were in the Netherlands, so uh, a manufacturer of pyrolysis oil, and in Australia, an LVL manufacturer. And by looking at these cases, what we were trying to identify is not just what economic incentives were provided to new investors, but how, what was the entire process? What was the ecosystem of opportunities in each location? And that could include training, uh, logistics, uh, just general government support for the industry, and also for sure site-specific characteristics. I'll share a few of the lessons that came out from each product type. And these, the purpose of doing this study was to orient ourselves in terms of how we were going to communicate Maine abroad. Uh, so some of the lessons and um, that we've identified per, per category um, identify some weaknesses in Maine, but also some opportunities. So for example, in mass timber uh, or CLT, which is a very attractive product for Maine, you know, we saw that in different countries, grants for R&D, testing and certification were important to overcome barriers to market entry, but also things like provision of land and buildings or sites that could be easily updated to produce mass timber were, were useful incentives. LVL, which is a more established market, the, there was not much need for uh, very strong investment attraction efforts or incentives. Um, because the, the market is strong, is pulling, pulling LVL into the marketplace. For MDF and particle board, which is a much more uh, intricate process to develop or requires more capex, uh, there's a lot more demand on the individual site characteristics. And so that means really for Maine, understanding what its sites offer and you know, the cost of power, access to water, and things like that. For nanocellulose, which is an emerging product, and Maine is a leader in the manufacture of nanocellulose. Um, continued grants for R&D, partnerships, identifying offtake agreements, supporting the marketing and the strategic ventures for export were very important to other locations that, that were successful. In dissolving pulp, we actually identified some um, uh, red flags. Uh, these are large investments in many cases, uh, retrofitting or changing the, the, a pulp and paper mill into a dissolving pulp mill. And one of the case studies that you'll see in the report from Quebec really points to the dangers of over, um, over supporting something from a government perspective or underwriting an investment too largely. And then in the, uh, the cellulosic sugars and pyrolysis oil, these are you know, increasingly attractive products in the market. Cellulosic sugars, it's still in for many, uh, an unknown quantity. There's a lot of different products that can be made from that base of cellulosic sugars. So understanding the routes from R&D to commercialization are extremely important. And then the sustainability of the resource is a very important factor for many of the biofuels producers. And lastly, pyrolysis oil, which is a, very interesting candidate for Maine because of the reliance on home heating oil. Uh, the local markets are very important. And one of the cases that we identified in the Netherlands, um, there was a, an offtake agreement that guaranteed the pyrolysis oil manufacturer a long-term offtake contract, which allowed them to invest more heavily in their manufacturing. To summarize, the, we looked at what are the key characteristics that really drove the investment. So for anything in the forest sector, resource availability and resource costs were very strong drivers of investment, followed by the existing infrastructure, and then R&D partnerships for any of the emerging products, access to financing, uh, particularly for new products that 
potentially need venture capital or other sorts of co-financing in the form of grants. And then lastly, market access. Um, market access for sure for the larger and heavier products, having regional uh, and low cost transport to some, uh, some large population centers are important. In terms of what the economies did, we identified a few characteristics in the cases. So in all the cases, except in the, the LVL manufacturer in Australia, there were direct financial incentives. Uh, they took different forms. In Canada and Finland, in the Netherlands, there were incentives, but also, uh, like I mentioned with the case in the, the Netherlands, more creative um, opportunities in terms of helping uh, guarantee an offtake agreement for uh, a paralysis oil manufacturer or support for training uh, to to upskill workers to be available for a new a new investment. And then lastly, we see in Canada, Finland, and the Netherlands, a real whole of state and industry transformation where there was a lot of cooperation between government and industry, uh, particularly around policy setting and embracing the bioeconomy as a strategy to align investment and political decision making. So with those lessons, we'd like to share now a few of the examples of how we're marketing Maine, and then I'll get lastly into the process of how we're marketing Maine and hand it off to Ashley. The first thing, and like I mentioned, we engaged Sutherland Weston to help us uh, make very attractive slides and, and materials. I'll share a couple of those right now. But in terms of the content, what we're, we're marketing Maine, for sure, the resource, the, the amount of wood you have, the unique characteristics of it being so much uh, certified as sustainable, uh, met much of the wood in Maine being held by private ownership is attractive to many. And that there's, a, there's an abundant supply and it's sustainably managed. The second key, uh, key characteristic that we're marketing is Maine's access and position geographically uh, in New England and the size of the economy in New England, which might not be really understood by people in parts of Europe or Asia. And the number of people living uh, in close proximity to Maine. Uh, the third characteristic is the infrastructure. And that's something that's in continual evolution. So presenting the, um, the existence of the, exist you know, the, the road networks, but also the unique characteristics of the private road networks, the upgrades to the railroads and the seaports, uh, and and communicating very clearly that if you do business in Maine, you can you can ship your product pretty much anywhere. Uh, then, in terms of financing, that Maine is a stable macroeconomic environment. That there are new tax credits available in Maine for renewable chemicals and fuels. There are innovation grants available, and that banks in Maine have a long history in the forest product market. And when it comes to R&D, we think this is a very important part of doing business in Maine. The University of Maine system, its expertise on many of these products is a, a very attractive um, characteristic of the state of Maine. And the University of Maine has many commercial uh, partnerships already. So there's a, there's a long track record of that. And then lastly, but definitely not least, it's the workforce that Maine has many uh, trained people that have been working in the forest sector uh, the professional logging contractors, the workforce development community uh, in the community college training programs are important uh, aspects to to guarantee basically to outside investors that you have a, a skilled and available work uh, workforce. Just to share, these are two of the products we've we've produced. Uh, so we have a, a short guide to presenting. The, uh, the opportunities in Maine in the narrative of a porous bioeconomy and integrating a bit more in that product, the commitments that the government and the, um, the governor in particular has made to the sector and to fighting climate change, which is a, uh, a key part of promoting a sustainable bioeconomy. And then a set of pitch decks that we're using in meetings with potential investors, uh, highlighting different aspects of the uh, forest bioeconomy in Maine. We also put a lot of effort in developing a site database. So you can go on to the Four Maine website now and you can see this website. 
uh, because of uh, we were operating in COVID, we wanted to provide investors around the world with an opportunity to learn more in more detail about the opportunities and the sites that are available in Maine. So we collected information from the um, from public sources, but also more detailed information from uh, leaders in each location in Maine, particularly in uh, coordination with the four Maine Communities Committee. And so someone sitting in their office in Estonia can click on a, a site in Maine and learn more about what the resources like there, uh, the availability of the sites, the characteristics, the infrastructure, and that ideally replaces some of the initial trips that someone might make to Maine to understand more. Uh, lastly, just how we're working together in the outreach. So we've now moved to a more aggressive outreach. We are using our uh, industry contacts to um, generate some interest in speaking with Maine. We've worked through with Four Maine a process whereby if Indu4 generates leads, we know who to hand it off to in Maine, uh, and we know uh, what uh, what steps we need to take to prepare for the conversations, particularly since we're not no one is traveling to Maine internationally right now. Um, so we did it systematically. We de developed a list of uh, high probability uh, leads. We did research. We've contacted uh, many of them. We've uh, engaged in conversations with them directly and then also set up conversations for Four Maine to take, take the next step. Obviously, we're not in Maine. What we're attempting to do is um, lay the groundwork for a successful conversation and ideally convert some of these initial interests into projects in the future. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much for your participation. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, there is one question from the audience and uh, the question is, did you look at biochar at all? Yes, thanks. We did look at biochar in the market analysis, which was in the, the 2018 uh, work we did. Uh, the process for that project was we developed a long list of products and we started to um, basically grade them in terms of their suitability for Maine. So that meant, do they meet the four main objectives in terms of job creation, economic investment, and would they would Maine be an attractive place to for someone to invest in? It was during that process that biochar, we did look at it. It's available, you can learn more about our analysis on the, um, in the market analysis study that's on the website. Um, we are not actively pursuing biochar investment right now, but it doesn't, but many of the processes, for example, in the production of fuels, biochar is a, a, an important uh, residual and finding markets for that would, would be important. I think from, from Induforce perspective, our guiding principle, uh, or at least making sure that Four Main gets the most value for the money that um, that they can, we're looking for large international players that might not be um, aware of Maine right now. Thanks, Jeff. And I think Senator Susan Collins touched on this uh, briefly in the introduction, but um, another member would like to hear more about the tax credit for renewable chemical and material and fuels. Actually, we know more details about that, but it's um, there's a, a uh, I think it's eight cents per pound of renewable product being produced uh, as tax credit and maybe six cents of renewable fuels, but Ashley can correct me. There was something signed by the governor at the beginning um, of last year, and it was LD 1698, I believe, if you want to look it up, but I think um, to Jeff's point, you receive a tax credit for every gallon of a product produced um, to a certain cent. Terrific, thank you. I think right now there are a number of questions coming in, but I think I'm going to introduce Ashley, uh, allow you to do your presentation, and then uh, we'll field all these questions so you, uh, the two of you can answer them uh, collectively. So Ashley Pringle is the Vice President of Operations at Maining Company, a private nonprofit organization that provides free and confidential consulting services to businesses looking to relocate to Maine or expand within the state. She works closely with executives with high growth companies looking to expand workforce and leverage Maine's ecosystem of cost-effective workspace, skilled labor, and much improved quality of life. Before joining Maining Company in 2014, she served as an active duty officer in the United States Army Ashley holds a BA in political science from St. Michael's College in Vermont 
and she earned her MBA from the University of Southern Maine in Portland. So Ashley, I will turn it over to you to start your presentation. Great, thanks Rob. Um, well, good morning everyone. And so it kind of, what Maine Company does is the business attraction piece, right? So as Indifor is going out and creating those leads or generating those leads across the globe, they need someone here in Maine to hand them off to. So that's where Maine and Company has partnered with For Maine to take on that role. And one of the things that we're trying to be very respectful of is there are a lot of partners within Maine in the same direction, um, going in the same direction and trying to help with that business recruitment and also business retention at the same time. So what we try to do is be that one point of contact for that company or that lead when Indifor makes a handoff to have a friendly face or, you know, person that they can reach out to with questions about how things work in Maine. So we try to understand what their needs are and what they need to be successful here and match them up with our other partners here in the state to um, try to make it successful as possible. So we're just at the beginning stage with the work with Indifor, as Jeff kind of laid out. There's been several phases. Now we're in that Indifor is doing the outreach part. And, you know, we've seen a couple of trends that I think the audience might be interested in is. So currently, Maine and Company works across all industries. So think financial services, manufacturing, a lot of aquaculture these days, um, but also forest products. And what we're realizing is that when Maine is competing for a project within forest products, we're competing globally. So we're competing against a Finland or a Japan or Chile. We're not competing against a Vermont, New Jersey, or North Carolina. So it's a very different approach when you're speaking to these companies or interacting with them for that matter. And because of that, you know, things get a little bit more complicated and complex. There are a lot of layers to a forest products company trying to make an investment here in Maine. And as Jeff highlighted, one of the most important variables is access to the resource. So our trees, right? That's a, that's a deciding factor. Um, very rarely in other industries, do you see the resource being the, the leading variable. It's usually more around workforce or um, access to market. So the fact that resource is driving that makes it a little bit more complex, and a little bit more layered. So what we're seeing and what we've seen in the past too is these projects can take several years from the point of shaking someone's hand and meeting them, or at least virtually right now, meeting them to the point of they're actually here making the investment, starting construction off. Um, so I think that's an important takeaway to understand is that these projects don't happen overnight. These companies are not making investment decisions with, you know, four week turnaround time. It's, it's months, if not years of research from the company, trying to match up the resource, trying to match up the market, the incentives as just pointed out and pulling everything together. So that's kind of our role at main companies. What we're trying to do is be that one point of contact to the entire process while bringing in the other partners here in Maine who can help support the projects. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are probably wondering how this has all changed business attractions since COVID because the lack of travel, are we still seeing companies interested in investment? What does that look like? And I can say you still have companies reaching out and they're interested in Maine and they're curious about investment and looking to make those moves, but it's just a slower process because um, they can't get here in person. We've had some of the companies that are willing to, you know, look through real estate on a Zoom video and, and but, you know, to explore opportunities in that way is very different than getting someone here in Maine, meeting with the local communities, seeing the sites in person. So it's a very different approach, I, but I would say that the companies are still interested in, they're trying to be creative on how they can still continue to do the site selection process in the midst of not being able to even travel here internationally. So that's kind of just like a high level 
um, of what Maine and Company is, you know, how we're working with Four Maine and their partners. Great, thank you. Uh, there are a number of questions. It was a question about uh, a portal uh, to, to showcase Maine's assets and how, how, how that's being considered. Maybe, maybe you could speak more about how, how the database might speak to that. Yeah, uh, so I see that's from Don, Don Tardy. Uh, we had the pleasure of meeting him uh, last year. And this was an important point of conversation we had uh, with him. The, the database that I they showed is an online portal. Um, and like I said, it has more detailed information than just a marketing website. So it is it does permit the user to go in and select, um, I would like to learn more about Northern Maine. Click a button and it will present some statistics on the wood, the species type, um, and then you can drill down and identify sites that are um, that were identified by the forming communities committee as available to to um, to market essentially. And then you can also click to see what other operations are nearby. So in the the logic of the bioeconomy is that you use the whole tree and that there's a sustainable resource supply. So a company that might have a lot of sawdust, you know, rather than shipping it to Canada, can they ship it to somewhere nearby for the manufacturing of another product? So we tried to give some uh, idea of the geography and the availability of the resource, the site characteristics, including um, anything particular about them. For example, do they have access to behind the meter power? Um, so those were, um, that's how we're showcasing Maine. And I think one of the, the, the things that's come clearly from our contacts with the industry related to Maine is they're not really interested in that much of the flashy presentation. They'd like to know how much wood is available, what's the cost and when, when can they get it? So we tried to, to market them in the, the language that they know. So in many ways, because Indufor's main client base, uh, is in the forest sector and we do wood supply analysis where we're also just trying to provide them direct information so they can start to make an idea of whether or not Maine would be even worth considering. So it's in that case, in that way. Um, the marketing materials, the pitch decks, the bioeconomy have a much uh, more um, holistic presentation of Maine, including information on uh, quality of life, the university system, and the climate commitments. So um, I, I believe the four main will be sharing that material with, with anyone that's interested. Great, thank you, Jeff. Uh, the next question is um, the connection between suppliers and producers. Is there any outreach that's been done to the heating oil, I assume, uh, distributors regarding um, pyrolysis oil? Um, right now, as it stands, pyrolysis oil uh, did not meet industry requirements, is not endorsed fuel. And so are those sort of connections being made? Yeah, we're, we're privileging um, engineered wood products in the first part of our outreach. And so um, we have not been discussing very much with companies interested in pyrolysis oil. At this stage, doesn't mean we won't. Um, I think Ashley might have more to say about that though? I think, you know, what we're hearing is that the industry is pretty excited to find that new technology um, or new technologies and bring them here to Maine, especially around the governor's initiative to be, you know, carbon neutral here in the future and what the industry that already exists in Maine can do to support that. So I think there's a ton of interest around that from what we're hearing. It's just a matter of going through in, in the outreach to Jeff, um, what he was saying about finding companies with those new technologies and bringing them in or expanding on the ones that might already be here. Great, thank you. Uh, there are a number of questions around uh, the state's climate goals and investments. Uh, the first one is, do you see a connection between uh, the state's climate goals and the types of products that are receiving investments? I can take that, Jeff, if you want for a second. What I have been um, impressed by is all these companies that we are connecting with through Indifor and some other initiatives right now around forest products. Everyone is focused around sustainability. That's the first thing that they want to talk about. They're not asking to say, 
hey, does Maine have $30 million? You know, do they want to give us for incentives? It's more is what's the political landscape at within the state for sustainability? How important is it? And all these companies are echoing the same um, goals that they have internally to their company is that it's one of their highest priorities. So it's, it's nice to hear that during the conversations. If I could just compliment that the, um, if you take the example of Finland, the, the industry diversification and the, the logic of the bioeconomy and the biorefineries was clearly a response to economic downturns, but the, you know, the Finnish bioeconomy strategy is squarely centered within the Finnish climate change mitigation strategy. And so that's, a, I think, a good example. The developments in Maine in terms of the uh, Maine can't wait climate change policy uh, really does present a, a very nice kind of framing for how we're, we're marketing uh, the opportunities in Maine. Companies, particularly the ones that we're talking to in Europe, they are they have commitments that they must meet in terms of uh, climate change mitigation um, and so they're very very familiar with with that and the logic of sustainable production there's also companies that we've been talking to in the biofuel sector in europe that are interested in um, so for example replacing normal oil and gas with with biofuels uh, and there's a very strong push in Europe to, to do that. Um, but there's also considerations on how sustainable are the biofuels. Uh, and so the, there's careful attention to all these issues. And I think, um, just so you know, kind of behind the curtain, one of the criteria we've always looked to when we're developing these lists of who we'll talk to are, are they aligned with sustainability? And, um, you know, we're, we're very attuned to that. And, Ideally, we'll, we'll find people that are interested in Maine for, um, for those reasons as well. Um, are companies you talk to seeking long-term fixed price supply contracts for wood? Other than that, what would be barriers to access to wood? Um, quickly, I think, yes, they would all love to have long-term fixed price supply. Um, one of the things that has emerged is, and Ashley's mentioned, that uh, you know, Maine's competing against a, a, a lot of economies and the price of wood, for example, if you're interested in making dissolving pulp uh, for hardwoods in Maine is higher than in Brazil. So, you know, how do you, that's a, that's a, a real barrier, um, the, the price of the, the fiber and the resource. Um, on, for other products that are more, you know, um, let's say that have a, a more local market that price becomes less important. Obviously it's important for the economics of the business, but um, you know, stability in terms of the, uh, the availability of the fiber is primary. And then the price I think are the, the second barrier, barrier. Oh, this, this is a great question. Are there overarching, we, we talk about this a lot. Is there overarching criteria to determine if potential investors are actually desirable? Um, how, do, how do we weed out um, you know, someone who comes to Maine and making inquiries, whether it's not actually something we want to um, pursue. And specifically the, this, uh, this inquirer asked in relation to Maine's climate goals, which we've already spoken to, but um, how do we weed out what, what, we, what we want and what we don't want strategically? <laughs> I'm laughing because we've had a, a lot of conversations around this and um, it's been something that we have focused a lot of our attention on because to that point, we don't want to waste anyone's time. And we want the work from four main with the end of four contract to be most impactful as possible. So there are definitely some variables that we've looked at with companies of what we would find to be more attractive. Um, a lot of that comes with lining up companies that need the resources of the forest basket of what we actually have to offer, you know, being number one the health of the company, making sure that they're in good financial standing, that they are, you know, existing in another market or our economy right now, and maybe looking to expand is, in, you know, having a strong track record with their employees, with their customers is, you know, very important. So those are some of the things that we've been looking at as we start, you know, we, we, our work with Indifor, right? A large number of companies we started off with and, and how do we 
funnel that down to a handful that we want to focus on. So there are there has been a lot of attention around that to make sure that we are attracting what we think could be successful here in Maine. Because we don't want anyone to come here and not be successful, right? And we want someone who's going to support our state and not hurt it. So that's definitely a, been a focus of this project. Great, thanks, Ashley. Um, during the COVID era, this is a question about how we are promoting Maine um, following following COVID. How has that changed? Um, how do you find the most important what do you find most important to investment attraction by companies and investors, given the limitations that you each have mentioned in your remarks? Which you, uh, what should we in Maine be thinking about to position Maine forest products opportunities in the post-COVID era as economies open up more fully? I'll, I'll go first, maybe, and then Ashley, you want to conclude? I mean, I think the primary thing is the, the inability of uh, showcasing Maine at conferences or it, having people come visit in, in person, I think it's actually quite interesting. I think we're finding that it's easier to be in touch with people now in some ways because people are home at their, at their desk um, to get that first introduction. But really then it, you need good information, you need the right information at the right time. And so I think working with the four main committees and a lot of effort going into uh, preparation has been very, very positive and also the emerging products committee that can evaluate technologies or evaluate companies. So having both sides of the, 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 the transaction ready um, are kind of useful. From our client base, we've seen a lot of companies using COVID as an opportunity to do strategic planning and think about where they're going to grow. So I'll leave it at that. I would just add, I think that response time is critical for a lot of those companies. So to Jeff's point is when a company reaches out or they need information to be able to provide that in a timely manner can be critical to if Maine's gonna make it to the next phase of their site selection process. So having that information ready, but also having the process ready. So who's going to be intaking the company? Who's gonna be listening to their first conversations of what their needs are and, and how that handoff is gonna work hey, Ashley. through the entire process? Ashley, thank you. 